Tonight, the future in a word, eggs. Then Lou Maresca drops by to talk about his first computer, Cortana, holographic goggles, and Microsoft. Padre's Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padre's Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Padre's Corner, episode 22, recorded January 27th, 2015. Geeking out with Lou Maresca. Welcome to Padre's Corner. It's the Twitch show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane. On the other side, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. This show was really a chance for us to talk about some of the stories that may have slipped through the cracks of the Newsweek. And uh, we'll bring it through the style of our chat room. That's right, the geeks, the gals, the, the nerds, the tweakers, the dorks, all those folks who used to be at the edge of the society and now control the future. Well, maybe that much, but uh, let's go ahead and start, as we normally do, with some freaking science. Now, I know that there are some hardcore geeks in our audience. I mean, that's what the Twit Army is all about. But uh, do you think maybe those hardcore geeks have given a thought to eggs? Specifically, I'm talking about what eggs are. I mean, let's let's all think about it. We've all had eggs in our life, unless you've got some weird egg allergy. And we all know that if you open up an egg in its raw state, you're going to get some gelatinous goop along with the yolk. And that gelatinous goop, for some reason, when you cook it, when you heat it up, it becomes solid. Now, I'm sure some of those hardcore geeks, those members of the Twit TV army, have probably put a couple of cycles of brain power into that, figuring out why it changes when it's heated up. Now, the easy answer is to say, well, because you cook it. When you cook it, it's going to look like that. But the far more interesting answer is also far more intelligent. Now, egg white is made mostly of protein. That protein is the food source for an embryo that's contained within a fertilized egg. In its raw state, that protein stays bonded in amino acid strings, and that's why an egg yolk is so slimy and stringy. But when you heat those proteins, you get two effects. The first is that as the heat slowly rises, it breaks apart those amino acid strings. And, uh, well, those amino acid strings are then, as the heat continues, turned into stronger bonds. That's right. It becomes a protein mass. That's why a boiled egg contracts from the shell, because the hardening of that mass and the breaking down of those amino acids actually expels water as a uh, as the lysosome. I'm, I'm totally misspelling that, missaying it. It's an enzyme is expelled from the protein mass. Now, that's interesting, and that probably answers a question or two for some of us who have wondered about eggs for any number of reasons, but it may not be all that important unless you actually take a look at science. Now, there have been some geeks, specifically some researchers from the University of California, Irvine, and uh, I believe it was Flinders University in Australia, who figured out a way to unboil an egg. Yeah, yeah, folks, I'm not making up that word. That's that's true. They've actually figured out a way to reverse the process, to turn a cooked egg with that protein mass that has expelled water and that enzyme back into that gelatinous goop. Oh, again, cool. And I'm sure that many people in the Twitter TV army would love to see that process. But uh, most normal people would say, well, why, why would I want to unboil an egg? Well, aside from freaking science, the answer is that our future may very well be uh, determined by that unboiled egg. You see, what these scientists figured out is that if you can reverse the process, if you could heat the protein mass and cause the proteins to break back apart and reform those bonds that uh, were first created by the amino acid strains, that you could create something that could be manipulated. In their paper, they described a device that would pull apart the tangled proteins from their strong bonds and allow them to reform weaker bonds. The process starts with eggs boiled for 20 minutes at 90 degrees Celsius. Then they soak those egg whites, that, that hardened egg white, in urea. That liquefies the solid material and recreates the clear protein lysosome. The protein pieces are still unusable because they're tangled, but at the end they get original unboiled proteins by running it through a basically a centrifuge. It's a spiral machine. They squirt the, the tangled proteins into that, and at the end of the process they get an unboiled egg white. Again, very cool, but why should we care? 
We should care because that very well may be the future of biomed. You see, when we start talking about some advanced treatments, specifically treatments for cancer that require custom proteins that can form antibodies that will attach themselves to cancer cells, you need these untangled proteins. And it's very difficult to make them. Right now, they can make them on an incredibly small scale using chicken ovaries, basically. They can't get a lot of them, which means that the, the process is incredibly slow and incredibly expensive. This new process that these researchers from the University of California, Irvine, and in Australia have come up with not only makes the process cheaper, but it makes it faster on an order of thousands, thousands and thousands of times faster than the old process. That means mass-produced, custom-made proteins, which means maybe if we come up with a cure for cancer, we can give thanks to breakfast. Now, when we come back, uh, we're going to go ahead and have a little chit-chat with uh, one of my favorite people, Mr. Lou Maresca. He's a senior software lead for Microsoft. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a look at some tech. One of the questions that I've been getting a lot in my inbox has been from people who got new devices, laptops and desktops, over the Christmas break. Now, they've been wanting to know how they can hook up multiple monitors because they've seen my setups, and I do have a lot of monitors. In fact, my primary station, I think, has a 4K monitor, two 2K monitors, and then two uh, 1080p monitors connected to them. Now, there's not that many outputs on that machine, so what I've been using is I've been using a combination of the internal graphics card plus some Thunderbolt and USB adapters. So I thought maybe we should take a look at one of the USB adapters that I trust the most. Do you spend a lot of time finding ways to connect your various peripherals and cables into your laptop or Ultrabook? Well, if you do, pay attention, because we've got the StarTech Universal USB 3.0 Laptop Dock. The StarTech USB 3S Dock HD is a universal docking station designed for those with USB 3.0 equipped laptops. Measuring 7.7 .7 inches long, 2.8 inches high, 4.9 inches wide, and weighing less than 13 ounces, the StarTech Dock is well sized for even the slimmest of notebooks. It requires an i3 CPU with 2 gigabytes of memory or better and is compatible with Windows XP and above as well as Mac OS 10.6 and up. Combining a DisplayLink 3900 video chipset with a Realtek 8211E Ethernet adapter and a VLI A10 USB interface, the dock gives you dual displays, gigabit Ethernet, full audio, and a powered USB 3.0 hub, all in a single package. On the back of the dock you'll find connectors for DVI, HDMI, and VGA video, a single gigabit Ethernet port, 3.5mm jacks for speakers and microphone, and two USB 3.0 ports. On the right side of the unit, StarTech added a third USB 3.0 port, while the left side has a Kensington lock port, the USB uplink, and a jack for 5-volt power. You can use two of the video connectors at a time, either HDMI and DVI or HDMI and VGA, but not VGA and DVI, with a maximum resolution of 2048 by 1152 per screen. Using the dock is simple. Connect all the peripherals that you intend to use, power the dock, then connect the single USB 3.0 uplink into a USB 3.0 port on your notebook. You'll automatically get a display link pop-up that will install the drivers necessary to use the onboard video device. I was up and running in less than 90 seconds. Performance of the unit is impressive, thanks to the 5 gigabit per second transfer rate of the USB 3.0 bus. I was able to drive all three screens at 1080p resolution with no discernible lag, pixelization, or artifacting. I tried to stress the dock by pulling three HD streams from the network over the dock's gigabit Ethernet adapter while simultaneously displaying them on the monitors. But again, I had perfect display of all content, even as I ran them in the background while pulling data off a USB 3.0 hard drive. I did notice that by copying data from the USB hard drive to the network drive while simultaneously pulling three HD streams and pushing them out to the monitors, the CPU utilization would rise towards 90%. But that was just three points above where it would be, using a separate USB Ethernet adapter and the onboard HDMI port to drive just two monitors. The StarTech USB 3S Dock HD is available now with a two-year standard warranty. You can find it online for about $120. There's a lot to like about the StarTech USB 3.0 Universal Laptop Dock. 
it's the right size, the right weight. It's compact and yet it has all the ports that you need to connect all your peripherals. I also really like the performance. I tried to stress this a lot. I ran plenty of video. I, I used up a lot of data transfer devices over the bus trying to make it die and it just wouldn't. It's got the bandwidth, the performance that you need to do high quality video applications over that single USB 3.0 bus. I also like the price. At 120 it sounds like maybe it might be a bit too expensive, but consider all the individual components that goes into the StarTech dock. You've got the dual link display link adapter, you've got the gigabit ethernet adapter, the USB audio, and the USB powered hub. It's pretty much a wash in price, except this is a single unit, which means that I can have my nice little tower with a real docking station that has my laptop, my keyboard, my mouse, my USB, my sound device, and all my monitors in one little docking station. I like that. On the con side, I'd say the only negative I can think of is that it doesn't have more USB ports, specifically USB 2.0 ports. Yes, I like that it has three high-speed USB 3.0 ports, but you're going to use those up really quickly. I mean, one with mouse, one with keyboard, and you, then you have one remaining for something else. I would like to have had two to four USB 2.0 ports so I could plug my mouse, my keyboard, maybe my phone into those and then reserve the high speed ports for those hard drives or any applications that require a lot of transfer speed. Still, this is a really good dock. This is the solution that you want if you want that single point of connection between your laptop and your home system. If you're looking for a docking station, then I'd say that the StarTech USB 3.0 Universal Laptop Dock is a definite buy. I'm Father Robert Balasser with Before You Buy. I've been playing with the DisplayLink chipsets for quite a while, and I have to say, USB 2.0 was okay. It, it worked most of the time. It wasn't great. A lot of the products out there were, were a little bit subpar, and I couldn't really push the resolution that I wanted. But if you've got a newer computer with USB 3, it solves everything. Now, there were a couple of people in the chat room who were wondering about CPU usage. Well, here's the thing about DisplayLink. A lot of these laptops are going to be using integrated graphics anyways. So you're not really going to take a performance hit by having the video go over the USB bus. Remember, USB 3 can push 5 gigabits per second. So it, you're not really going to stress it even if you're pushing out 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. I've actually got seven different monitors running out of one desktop running USB 3 on four different ports, and I, it's not stressed at all. The other thing is if you have a video card with a capable processor, so it's got enough horsepower, it will actually render in the box and then push it over the USB interface. So you are getting the advantage of any GPU that you may have in your box already. It's a fantastic solution. I suggest you check it out. It's a display link. That, that particular dock was from StarTech, but if you are looking for a really easy way to expand your video options without opening the case or changing out a card, you got to check out display link. Now, this is my favorite part of the show. This is where we go ahead and we bring in a guest, someone who I admire, someone who I want to talk to, someone who I think deserves our geek attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Bono. <laughs> got my hollow lens on. I'm a little cold today. Uh, okay, uh, th there's a few things that uh, the audio listener should know about this. One is that Lou Maresca is a is a good friend of the Twit TV network. He's been on several of our shows. Two, he's actually a Microsoft employee, and he lives in Seattle, so he's wearing Seattle have, Seahawks have garb. To. Yeah, I'd have to. Yeah, they, they Otherwise, get... they throw me outside yeah, at work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lou, thank you very much for coming on the Padres Corner. It's been a year. I think the last time you were on the show was when we were still in beta. It might have been like the third episode back in February of 2014. So uh, it's it's nice to have you back. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Uh, l let me ask you this. But, but before we get into all the Microsofty goodness, because there was a lot of announcements made over the past week. There was a, there was a big bomb drop uh, and some very interesting tech that Microsoft let out into the world. Let's let's talk a little bit about you. There are going to still be some members of the Twit TV RV who maybe haven't seen you. You've been on This Week in Enterprise Tech. You've been on Coding 101. You've been on uh, Padres Corner. Uh, we're going to get you on Before You Buy and on Know How. So you're kind of slowly, show by show, taking over the, uh, the network. Tell us a little bit about who you are. You bet. So I'm a software developer at Microsoft. I've been there for probably about, um, about almost 11 and a half years. And um, electrical engineer at heart, pure science degree, geek at heart, 
followed uh, the screensavers back in the day and I've and, uh, been following Twitter ever since the beginning and uh, just loving this stuff, geeking out all the time. Uh, let's let's back up a little bit. One of the questions that I always ask the guests for Padres Corner is where they got their geekness. Because, I mean, it, it doesn't happen to everybody. There are some people who will use technology, who like technology, who uh, integrate it into their daily lives, but you wouldn't really call them geeks. I mean, they don't, they don't go that extra step. They don't always want to know how everything works. They don't always want to know what's behind the curtain. You are one of these people. So what gave you that love for technology, for science, for, for technology and engineering? So my dad is like a first generation chemist in the family. He were, used to work for GE and he got 101 patents. He's just a, a all around scientist. And he used to push me to try to learn. He'd bring home microscopes from the lab and bring home the, you used to get those chemistry sets when you were a kid, but he used to bring down, bring home the real stuff. And we used to blow things up and mix things. And so it's, it was at my nature to just want to know how, how things worked. And it's the, probably the same story you hear from a lot of geeks. In fact, I think Steve Gibson even said it last week on Coding 101 was like, oh, he just loved to take stuff apart. And that's really what I love to do. In fact, if you look behind me, I just have like a disaster station of just pulling stuff apart. In fact, I pulled apart my icicle mic input tonight and I resoldered it so it worked for tonight. So, I mean, that's that's just the type of stuff I've been doing since the beginning. And it's just it's never stops. And now with tech being in such the forefront, it's like never going to end for me, I don't think. We've got a question from the chat room. Uh, I, I scrolled past, but somebody wanted to know what was your first computer, your first real computer? <clears throat> Not back there anymore, but it's the it was the Apple uh, the Apple Lisa. Wow, wow. Okay, that's that takes you back a little bit. Yeah. Did you take that apart? <laughs> actually, I did not. I did not take that apart. I did have other computers. I had an Atari that I actually took apart. I used to take that apart a bunch of times, put it back together, make sure it worked again. Um, you know, I, there's all tips. In fact, I used my first real like PC PC was probably uh, an old IBM back in the day, and I used to take it apart to put new modems and different stuff inside of them. But I mean, really, it took just small, you know, small at the time. My dad had a computer he brought home that had just the. Uh, the LED screen, the monochrome LED screen. I used to take that apart. I had the phone on the side of it. I used to take that apart because I was completely blown away. There was a phone like attached to this computer. So I used to take that apart. He used to hate me because he had to bring it to work the next day and have some tech guy put it back together. But And that's the kind of stuff that I used to do all the time. And that's kind of what keeps me going. Uh, Lou, you are, you are one of the people who you can't have that religious war about Mac, PC, Linux because I know for a fact you use all of them. You have all those platforms. In fact, probably within Camera Shot, you've got your MacBook. You've got a Windows PC. I know you have a Windows phone. You probably have an iPhone and, a, and an iPad. <laughs> For you, you're kind of agnostic, right? It's it's They're just tools, and that's what you do. Whatever's best. I just, you know, at the point in time, like at the time, about three years ago when I bought my MacBook Pro, it's, it was just the best machine out there. Um, and you know, and they still are pretty darn good machines. In fact, I'm look actually looking forward to when they come out with this MacBook Air Pro, whatever they're coming out with, 12 inch that they're supposedly allegedly coming out with soon. Looking forward to that. But I have an Android phone. I have the One Plus One, uh, thanks to you guys. And uh, actually, uh, and I have a um, I have Windows Phone, and I have you know I have tons of stuff. I have a Windows. I'm working on Windows PC right now. Um, I have a bunch of a couple iPads. I have a couple iPads at work, Android tablets, you name it, I have it. So it's yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's really what I've already need to use at that moment, I guess. All right. However, there is one thing I I, I want to geek out with you over this for just a second. When I was a kid, and that's way back. I mean, really, that's go go deep, go long. <laughs> one of the things that sort of separated Mac users from PC users, at least on the surface, was the fact that PC users like to tinker. I mean, we had to build our PC. We didn't buy it. Uh, and But, you know, we would kind of look at Apple people like, okay, well, that's cool, but you don't open that box. I mean, you buy the box and you use the box and you throw the box away and you upgrade when it's time to go. And we kind of, I mean, I'll be honest, we kind of laughed at that. I mean, I, I didn't feel right unless I could get in there and actually play with it, modify it, upgrade it. That was part of the fun of it. But as I've gotten older and as the PC market has matured, we've all, all manufacturers have kind of gone to that black box version, right? Which is you buy it, you use it for a couple of years, and then you replace it. Who cares about upgrading? Yeah, I think that's the case. I think, uh, you know, as long as you buy the right parts too, nowadays you could probably get 
I mean, I'd be squeezing about I, my new PCs, uh, you know, Haswell E, but I, I, my old PC is, uh, you know, probably seven years old. I just rebuilt it this year. So, I mean, that's kind of the key is you got to, you know, as long as you know what you're picking and what you're choosing, you're putting enough effort into it, you, you can really outlast what, what you put it, what the effort, the money you put into it. So, I mean, you know, I, in fact, I've, you know, I can constantly, I actually can admit that I've built a Hackintosh in my day because I just, I really like some of the software that's on OS X and some of the things you can do and being able to build for iPad. And I wanted the power of being able to build my own machine too. So, you know, I had done that in the past, but you know, it's too bad that they're kind of a closed ecosystem. I really wish they would kind of expand on that and uh, actually, you know, give, give it the capability to make hardware or build hardware for them. Uh, now, I, I do want to go into a touchy subject here because everyone in the chat room knows that you work for Microsoft. And uh, don't don't say anything that's going to get you into trouble here. But I, I see this question coming up over and over in the chat room. And that is, what kind of changes have you seen as we moved from the Bomber era now to the Nadella era? Because those who have been watching closely have seen some major changes. Changes not just in in how the company is run, but in how the products and the divisions are structured and the overall philosophy of the company. I mean, one of the big things that no one ever thought was going to happen was Microsoft's involvement in the open source community uh, and, you know, the movement away from the siloed products. How has that affected you as a Microsoft employee? What, what have you been able to see? Yeah, see, over the years, I've tried to push really hard myself to, to kind of reach out to other teams and other groups because with Microsoft, you have, you know, you know, with, you know, with HoloLens and stuff coming out, you, people are starting to see that Microsoft has a lot of, you know, hands and a lot of things. But, you know, one of the things that they don't know is they have, you know, departments that maybe not, you don't even actually ship anything. They just do research. And so the thing is, I used to, you know, when I started, even then they had departments that were making hardware and, you know, doing, you know, video and doing, you know, audio and doing gaming and stuff that, you know, they maybe didn't even ship anything. So I, I used to reach out all the time because I wanted to just learn and suck up all that information. But what, you know, with, with the Balmer era kind of gone and with Satya coming in, one of the things that's part of your commitments now is that you're supposed to break through the barriers of, of these, these structured teams. Um, you know, Balmer kind of started it with kind of, you know, kind of breaking down the company into smaller subsets, smaller divisions like OSG operating systems and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, Satya has really pushed the envelope and said, you know, we don't want to hear the excuse anymore. He doesn't say this. This is my word. This is my interpretation is we don't want to hear the excuse anymore that, you know, you don't know somebody on a team or that, you know, or that management's telling you not to. We want you to go out and we want you to build and we want you to hack and we want you to put things together and we want them then to show us that stuff that you do. And maybe that might actually become a product. And that's really kind of what a lot of these things that you're seeing today are coming from. I mean, people decide, hey, I want to take the resources of all the research people that are Microsoft Research and I want to build something that's like, you know, you know, uh, uh, augmented reality glass, you know, I want to, I want to build something that can track your movements. I mean, those types of things. I mean, there's a tech, uh, show internal every year it's with Microsoft research and you can go and you can sign this waiver and you can go in there and you can see all the cool things that, you know, that you can never talk about. And there's just some crazy stuff in there. I mean, I just, I just wish that some of it would come out even more, but now they have the public kind of hack and -on type thing that Microsoft has. And that's where the culture is going is, you know, kind of the Facebook model of hack. Hey, go and hack it out, try it, do it, and then show it. And then maybe it'll actually branch and, and, and expand on the products that we have. Right, right. You know, uh, for me, there was a moment, it was maybe four, four years ago, when uh, we were considering deploying Windows phones for our, uh, our national operation in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and, you know, we had Microsoft backend servers. We were running a, a, a Microsoft uh, Exchange for our email server. And we just figured, okay, well, this will be a good fit. Now we'll have enterprise class security and we'll be able to use all of our Microsoft services. And the very first time we tried to do a deployment and it told us that we couldn't connect to the exchange servers with, with, with the <laughs> Windows phones because we had to buy another <laughs> module from the Windows server division. That's when we, we kind of looked at each other and we said, wait a minute, what, what's going on over there? I mean, <laughs> it should just work, right? It's a Microsoft product. It doesn't connect to a Microsoft server. That's r ridiculous. That's and, and, you know, that, I, think, I think that's gone away. Uh, I, I just remember I took a look at the latest, the, uh, the enterprise offering for, uh, for Microsoft. And this, this idea of we're going to give you your desktop 
and all your applications and everything else that you may have purchased from us, and we will let you access it from any screen, anywhere, on any device you want. That's ridiculously different. That's, that is so different from the Microsoft that I was really starting to hate that said, I want you to pay again for every device you own because, well, that, that division needs to get paid and that division needs to get paid and the server division doesn't want to work with the mobile division because, well, each of them is going to get people fired and they don't want it. They don't want their people to be the ones who are fired. So I, I think, I think in that term, it's, it's actually been successful, at least to the outside world. It's, it's looked pretty positive. Yeah, one of the one of the philosophies they're trying to follow now too is you know they have Microsoft used to follow this what they called the bolt on the bolt on principle like you know nuts and bolts bolted on, and the thing is you know they used to be able to provide you with applications that you could kind of bolt on to your PC that kind of expanded its capabilities, and some people sometimes are required like I need an application to be able to like you said create virtual virtualized environments or I need an application to allow people to remote in, and so all these are kind of bolted on you know, later as an afterthought. But the thing with Microsoft now is their principles are starting to get stronger and they're trying to say, you know what, we know what customers need. We're just going to make it as part of the operating system. There's going to be bolt. It's not going to be bolted on anymore. It's not going to be a second thought. It's going to be built in. And uh, I think it's a good, a good principle to follow. And now with this whole streaming service, streaming capability of streaming updates down to your PC, big updates, big changes, you know, to the operating system, uh, and now it gives them the ability to kind of like deliver that fast. And so it should be a really interesting next couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> Lou, the, the reason why we brought you on to Padres Corner tonight was because you were on This Week at Enterprise Tech yesterday, and we had you on for a segment where we were talking about some of the announcements that were made over the last week from Microsoft. Specifically, they talked about some of their new enterprise releases, of course, the new version of Windows, and some additional products that really kind of wowed people around Xbox and uh, augmented reality. Oh, we ran out of time. Uh, we, you know, we did 15 minutes and it was time to go. So we invited you on to Padre's Corner. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up a little bit where we left off. Let's, let's do a quick refresh. If you could run down some of the killer features from Windows 10, what were the things that were announced that people should be aware of? So I think the first thing was what we were talking about just a second ago is like does delivery method. So they want to be able to deliver you an update for free for the first year um, as a consumer. Um, so if you have Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 7, they're going to update you free for the first year. And then we don't really know what's going to happen after that. But I'm, I'm going to guess they're probably going to make it a paid uh, application just like they do today. Is if you want to upgrade, you pay a certain upgrade fee. But for the first year, it's free. No questions asked. Um, and that will just come along with Windows Update. Uh, the second part is, and that's what they call, uh, the second part is what they call Windows as a service. And so Windows as a service, it means that they're going to continue to stream updates, not just, you know, security updates like they did before, feature updates, things changing the operating system, tw slightly tweaking your experience without just coming out with a full-blown thing and just shocking the heck out of you. So they're just trying, basically trying to stream that down to you. Um, there's also a whole slew of like smaller features, like we talked about uh, start menus back, they give you the, tab the, the tiles on the start menu. Um, Cortana integration, which gives you the ability to, it would, right now I think it's limited functionality, just search, but they want to be able to you to launch apps and dictate and find documents across different platforms. Um, there's also the Xbox DVR, the gaming DVR for Windows, which allows you to take 30 seconds of video uh, from you know your gaming, whether it's Steam or it's uh, Xbox. There's Xbox One streaming, which we can go in more and talk about. Um, there's a bunch, a whole slew of a bunch of new universal apps, you know, from maps to um, navigation to clocks. Um, there's a new store that's a unified store. Um, and so that means that the cross platform, you can do, you know, phone and, and or different organizations and enterprise stuff. There's also a new browser. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more in depth. It's called Spartan. Um, and what it is is really just a broken down version of the new Trident engine just to make it more faster and more uh, more efficient. Um, there's a whole slew of office apps. Um, there's a whole bunch of new office apps. Universal apps are kind of like, <clears throat> you know, the, the Windows Store apps that they have, but making them more cross-platform to all different types of devices. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can continue to list. <laughs> no, but before we go on, let's let's clear up the subscription thing because sure. uh, there, we had we had confusion yesterday in the chat room. We've got confusion tonight in the chat room. Let's let's make this really clear. So correct me if I'm wrong. This is my understanding. The whole idea of upgrading for a year. It's not that they're going to upgrade you for a year. Then if you don't continue to pay, you're locked out. The whole idea is Microsoft wants to move as many people. 
from Windows 7, Windows 8.1, and Windows 8.1 phone to Windows 10. So for a year, if you upgrade, it's free. It won't cost you anything. The subscription model, this, this gets people confused because they're like, okay, so wait a minute. After a year, do I have to start paying or my Windows goes unpatched? No, that's, that's not what you're saying. My understanding is you'll still get the security patches, but you won't get new features. That's what the subscription is for. Uh, we're used to it. Windows users are accustomed to buying an OS release. And then if you want new future features, you have to buy another OS release. With the subscription, they just get streamed to you. They just get added onto your box, and they're ready for you to use. That's that's my understanding of what the subscription service is, right? I mean, you don't have to go it that way. You could use the old model, which is I'm going to buy this OS, I'm going to stay with this OS, and then I'm going to choose to upgrade in the future. But what Microsoft is thinking as a service is that some people would just like to have the updates automatically ended, added to their boxes. You know, that actually makes a lot of sense. To be honest with you, I, I don't actually know. And I, to be clear, I don't actually know what happens after that first year. I, I guess my understanding of, you know, that concept was they're trying to really force people, not force people, really get people to kind of adapt Windows 10 right away to kind of jump off because they have really slow adaption up front. Uh, people are kind of afraid to upgrade and they really want people off of Windows 7 because it's kind of old. Um, and so they want you to jump first. So that's where they said, we'll give it to you free for a year. They want you to kind of jump on the ball right away because a lot of people say, hey, it's free. Might as well do it, right? Um, and they, they give you a lot of compatibility, backwards compatibility capabilities. So you can mostly ensure that your applications will still work. Um, and so that's kind of the key. But, you know, what happens after that, you know, still not clear. So I think it, what you said makes entire sense that, you know, Obviously, I, I don't think they're going to make you pay for security updates. I don't think they can legally, um, but I don't think they're going to make you pay uh, for security updates and, and to keep your op your operating system up to date. Um, the key here is just do you want to kind of buy into, that's kind of a play on words, but buy into the fact that you want to be at the bleeding edge of the operating system all the time. Um, people who constantly are running the App Store and OS X to update their OS um, you know, same thing with iPad, you know, constantly moving the new version of iOS. You know, do you want to be that person? And if so, then that's what the service streaming is going to be for. They're trying to kind of move to that model. Now, if you have to pay for that, I don't know. Right. And I, I will say this. I will say this. I actually had something like this. I was an MSDN Action Pack subscriber. So I, I would get the updates as they occurred and I could automatically put them on my, my machines. So I... I actually like that. I will pay. I used to pay $400 a year, but what that meant was that I got everything. Every every piece of software that Microsoft released into the Action Pack, I would automatically get. I didn't use all of it, but it was nice to know that the software I had was always up to date and I always had the latest feature set. Right. For some people, that doesn't make sense. For some people, they don't care about that. You know, They want their standalone box in the corner. That's fine. Uh -huh. I, I think what Microsoft's doing is they're kind of betting on this connected uh, future of communications as, well, why wouldn't you want your box to automatically be updated to the latest? And and why wouldn't you pay us a subscription fee if it meant that you automatically get features that you were going to pay for anyways down the line? Yeah, and plus being able to test huge updates like service packs to Windows is is actually really tough from a, mic, from a company perspective. You know, when they used to put out these service packs, I don't know if you've had the same problem in the past with Windows 7 and stuff, but I had problems where like I used to update these huge service packs and things would just stop working or my computer would freeze or or like I'd have to uninstall some of the KBs that were installed with the service pack because it was, you know, creating driver problems. I mean, they just used to put this massive thing on your machine and then you'd have a bunch of problems. And then, you know, and testing that's really hard, especially because there's unlimited hardware that you can build for a Windows PC. They have to be able to create a service pack that's going to work with all this different hardware. So it's just a testing nightmare. So for them to be able to stream, it's just little tiny things that they can say, hey, let's improve the, the not notification center on Windows to make it a better experience. Little things that they can improve and they can stream that down to you much easier so that, you know, and users get used to that. I think that's a better model to follow than these, these huge monolithic things that they do over time. Lou, tell me about Cortana. So Cortana has been hyped. We, we've heard about it for about a year now. Uh, we uh, Anyone who plays Halo knows what Cortana is. Cortana is actually the AI that guides the Master Chief. It's it's our, it's our the, the voice, it's the Jiminy Cricket in the back of our head if you're playing Halo. And they have brought it to uh, be an assistant. It's, new, it's the new Clippy. What exactly is Cortana supposed to be? <laughs> 
So Cortana is kind of the gate, the the entry point to the ability to use voice to have basically, in my eyes, really have unlimited functionality with your PC. You know, they have the dragons of the day and dragon dictations and the you know, the dictation capabilities in Windows, but they really want to take it to the next level. They want you to be able to not only control your applications, open them, closing them, maybe even control Windows, but they want you to be able to search and do other things with it that allow you to basically bring forth the power of your PC, the power of search, the power of, you know, the different services that Microsoft has, the different, even some of the things that they don't have. Like, for instance, you know, my understanding is, you know, a lot of days, a lot of times you can actually hook in search filters into your current Windows search that will be able to search Dropbox and other services. And let's say maybe now if Cortana can also use those filters to be able to search those documents by just talking to her. So, I mean, that's that's kind of the really the key to Cortana and what she brings to the table. And, and not only that, but she can actually bring that experience with her. So, like, you're on your phone or, you know, on your Windows phone or, or whatever, and you say, hey, you know, I need, what was that gift that I needed to buy, you know, for so-and-so's birthday, you know, and that was on a OneNote that was on your PC that was stored in OneDrive. She'll be able to kind of go out and find that for you and give it to you, you know, and you don't have to search through your PC to find it. You don't have to be by your PC to find it. So that's really kind of the power of Cortana. And that's kind of the vision that they're looking to do. And there's so much other things they want to do with it, um, you know, that I don't even know about yet. So, I mean, I'm sure that you'll see more and more as, as Windows 10 gets closer. Uh, what functions of Cortana are available if you're not online? Does it just completely disable if you don't have access to the Microsoft servers or do you maintain some functionality? So what I know is they most of it requires online, but from what I've seen, you, you, Cortana does still actually work. In fact, my PC at work had a, a network driver problem. I didn't even have, the card didn't even work. And when I turned my PC on, I could still talk and ask for documents that were on the, the local PC. But, you know, that might change depending on the release and, you know, what they what they need to be able to do with with her. And plus, it, you know, there, there could be some other dictation things that might require a much larger database that are not on the machine. So it de all depends on what, you know, how the release goes until the Windows 10 comes out. One of the things that Microsoft really pushed at the uh, the press conference was the faced forward approach they were doing to security. So security wasn't an add on security wasn't something that they just slapped dash together. It's first and foremost for Windows 10, specifically security of users' data going between mobile devices. That Microsoft is trying to set itself apart from all the other players and saying, you have control over your data and you have ways to make sure your data stays private. What does that mean past the PR buzzwords? <laughs> yeah. So they like to call them protection containers. And so what they mean is even though you have data separation across different platforms and different hardware, they want to contain that data. So they, they put basically markers on your data that then they can then track across devices, USB and whatnot, and enables them to basically follow that data wherever it goes. And so then when, when they will be able to do that, they can then do things like encrypt it in a specific way or, or store it in a specific way. Maybe it's pieced apart so that it's harder to put back together. So there's, there's, there's different ways for them to do it. And so then by being able to follow that data, they can do these sorts of things. And it makes it much easier to move data between layers, between services, drives, email, cloud, and still maintain the same level of protection that you had when you were on your just your basic you know, encrypted hard drive PC. So that's really kind of the key to Windows 10, and it's way over and beyond what BitLocker is. So BitLocker kind of was the consumer way of protecting your hard drive or USB drives, but this is the next level. And you know, the kind of the underlying, the the the, in, the internals of what how it works, I'm not fully clear on. But what I do know is it will allow you to kind of break apart data or encrypt it in a specific way that you can then travel between different mediums. One of the things that uh, a Microsoft insider was telling me about um, uh, last night. Uh, I was I was asking him about this feature, and he actually said that this was one of the things that he was most excited about because in the digital age, one of the biggest problems we have in the enterprise is data walks away. And it's, it doesn't have to be a hack. It could be someone silly at the office who decides to load 10 gigabytes worth of really sensitive data on a thumb drive and walk out of the office, and then he loses That's it right. on the subway. And that, right, that right. happens way more often than, than someone coming in over the firewalls. And what he told me, and I, I'm not... I wasn't sure if he was he was just exaggerating exaggerating a bit, but he said you can set this up so that 
you will never get to a point where you don't know how many copies of a piece of data are out there. And I, I was like, oh, okay, that's that would actually be kind of useful. I mean, if, if I had a way to manage my data so well that I could I could with certainty say there are only 15 copies of this and I can shut them down if I need to, that's actually worth it for me. I, I, I don't know if the technology actually does that, but I, I'd, I'd love to see it. Yeah, I think, I mean, from my understanding, and again, I don't, I don't know the internals of it, but I do know that they do tag the, the data. So that means that even maybe at the file system level, they'll be able to tag it and then track those tags. Uh, and that's where you get that count from. So I think that that's kind of the key is, you know, they're doing it at the much lower level than what people are used to. And that's really how they start to protect it. And I think, again, you'll probably see more and more as, as time goes on. And when that feature is kind of in the, the technical preview, people will probably, you know, reverse engineer it or whatever. But it's 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 some really cool stuff. And, it, you know, like you were saying, the number one thing, I mean, we we required to BitLocker or encrypt our hard drives, TPM or whatever at, at work. And even if you take your laptop with you, just like you said, you leave it unlocked for 30 seconds, somebody plugs the thumb drive in and boom, copies all the data off the encrypted hard drive, you're kind of done. So this is kind of where that feature kind of jumps in. Right, right. And, and uh, ultimately what it's going to be is it's going to be up to the user. You could disable everything. You could turn off all the super cool security features. The question is, why would you? Uh, in, in the past, you actually can get some decent security out of Windows 7 and Windows 8. It's just nobody turned them on. Uh, one of the key things he told me was in Windows 10, it's turned on by default. Uh, and that's that's actually big. That's big. All right, let, let's move on a little bit. I want to talk about Project Spartan. Uh, there's a lot of ridicule because people are saying, oh, so it's just IE with a different name. Uh, it, it, was this just a PR move? Was Microsoft just saying, oh, gosh, you know, IE has a really bad reputation. We should call it something else. What What is Project Spartan? <laughs> you know what? It might be a little bit of that. But I think one of the things that Project Spartan was about is, you know, they wanted to remove the heaviness of Trident and all kind of the extra stuff that it had to do over the years. Like, for instance, ActiveX controls and VB script and some of the layout quirks and emulating layouts and some of the other things that they used to have to do, document modes. They just wanted to kind of get rid of all that. And they wanted to go back to the roots of all the standards and just do them correctly. Uh, and they want to do them correctly and performantly. And in fact, we've seen with uh, Spartan itself, it's a new rendering engine, which they call Edge, is you actually they actually see almost some at some points 40 to 50 percent increase in performance uh, when you're rendering a page. And so that that's that's a lot. That's a that's a lot of processing power if you think about it when it comes to actually rendering uh, uh, something to the screen. And so what they did was they basically forked the, the Trident code. So they basically took the Trident code, made a copy of it in some some depot somewhere, and then they started pulling things out of it. And the reason why they did that is this way they can basically maintain the Trident engine, legacy engine, to make sure that it still has security updates and patches and make sure that it still works like it expected to work. Uh, but then also maintain this new high-performant lean and mean engine as well. And so the kind of the key here is what Spartan's going to do, the browser is going to be able to do, is going to be able to switch seamlessly between the two. So if you load up a page that might have an ActiveX control that you need to use for like an old enterprise app, enterprise mode that needs the kind of backwards compatibility, then it'll go back to this old Trident engine, this new, uh, what they call MS HTML DLL, and it'll go back to using that. And then, you know, as soon as you go to another page that doesn't require some of this old stuff, maybe some of the old tags, Try the Trident and then switches over to the Edge engine, and boom! Now you have the new engine, and it does it seamlessly. So the user's not going to know the difference. We've got, uh, I think we've got the uh, preview. We've got Doctor Morbius in the chat room who's wondering if if this is actually faster than GDI because forty percent sounds like a nice little bump. So I, you know, I think it all depends. I mean, I, I'm not really sure exactly, but I do know that it's 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 a substantial f speed difference. So there's some test sites. I think there's the technical preview. You can turn it on. Uh, I think it was Paul Thorat has a really good article on turning that on manually. Uh, and then you can go to the speed sites and actually ch test it out. But it's it's almost ridiculous the difference in speed that they're able to, to kind of take out and, and squeeze out of the graphics processor uh, when it comes to... Uh, and it's all because they're following these standards. And there's some really cool features they added to it too. Like for instance, there's things called Preserve 3D. Um, there's XPath, there's XPath capabilities for XML. There's web audio and media capture APIs and... Touch, you know, being able to do touch events directly in the browser. 
Um, there's also what they call content security policies, which is coming out new, and then the new HTTP2 standard. So there's lots of cool stuff that they're just injecting within this browser, and they're following the standards to the T. Um, and it, so it's more closely related to a modern browser rather than the old monolithic thing they used to call Internet Explorer. Now the key here is, like I said, Spartan is going to be there, but again, the Trident engine or the Internet Explorer version of it is still going to be there too. So that's where you kind of get the power of both worlds is, yeah, I got these old... So you don't get the excuse from somebody, I can't update to Windows 10 because I need to be able to use IE you know, 10 or IE 9.0 or 8.0 or, or 7 or 10.0 or whatever to be able to backwards compat to my office applications because of ActiveX or whatever, or VB script. So that's going to be there. That's still going to be there. But with, you know, with, with the, the edge mode, you don't actually need any of that. Uh, Lou, I, I'm going to ask for some wild speculation uh, on the part of both of us. Uh, <laughs> but you know, this, is, this is one of these geek questions that floats around in my head at night. And that is, if thinking about where we are today, especially with the browser, uh, so looking at Spartan or looking at Chrome, looking at Firefox, at Opera, at Safari, the browser has basically become the primary interface in the computer. That's that's where you do the majority of your work, the majority of the things that you have to do, you do through a browser. And then I think back to Windows 95 and Windows 98 and the antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft that made them split the browser from the OS. I'm wondering how much did that retard IE? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a part of me who's incredibly curious to see what what kind of devel development Microsoft would have had with browser tech. I mean, would they have gotten to Spartan 10 years, 15 years earlier if they had stayed with a model, if they had been allowed to stay with a model, which you could argue is now the de facto standard for computing today? Does that make sense at all? Yeah, I get what you're saying. I think I think the misconception though is when they were forced to remove IE, they were forced to remove the application, but not the capabilities. So, like one thing that you have to understand with IE is it's just really a shell for two things: one, a, a rendering engine, which they call Triton, and two, a JavaScript engine, which they call Chakra. And so, those two things can actually coexist without the browser, without the actual shell. And so when they were forced to remove it, it was really kind of a, you know, hey, I want to be able to use a different browser. I shouldn't be forced to have IE installed on this machine. But that doesn't mean that the engines didn't still coexist underneath the covers. In fact, applications that used to, like Office and other things, they, they use these engines, these, these Trident controls or whatever within their applications. And those are all still kind of fine grained with the Apri system. But I see what you're saying, you know, would it be, would they have kind of increased and been able to better themselves faster if they would have been able to, to fully integrate it with the operating system all the time. And I, I don't think so. I think it, maybe it was just the way that they, they went over and iterated over the application. They didn't necessarily put enough emphasis on it. Uh, but with the, with, with the rendition of IE10 and now I 11 and, and Spartan, they're, they're, they get it. They understand that you know, Chrome is darn fast and it's lean and mean and it's time to be lean and mean and darn fast ourselves. We have the technology and the resources to do it, and we have the, the market share. So it's time to start doing it, and that's really where Spartan comes into play. Well, I, I do want to jump in there. I use Chrome as my primary browser. I use actually Chrome, Firefox, and IE all for different things. I, I, I can say this because I use it a lot. Chrome used to be lean and mean. Recently, Chrome has just, I don't know what's going on, but it's gotten, I think it's gotten feature bloat, uh, <laughs> and it's, Go figure. Uh, we've got JJ to the 4884 in the chat room who uh, he's threatening suicide if, if I don't ask you, uh, what about Spartan extensions? <laughs> so my understanding is they, they're, they're trying to really stay away. So the, the idea is with, with I, I, excuse me, <clears throat> they had the plug-in model or the, or the ActiveX control model where you could build these special extensions on the browser that kind of also allow you to communicate to the the operating system and com components and all that stuff. With Spartan, they're trying to get away from that. So my understanding right now is that Spartan doesn't have a plugin model, but that could change. My get, I think, do know that they have a bunch of dev tools, some new F12 dev tools that are actually a uh, a plugin to the browser itself. So my guess is that's where that model is going to come from. If they ever do deploy a plugin model, it'll come from the fact that it's pretty powerful. If you can put a developer tool or a debugger 
that uses it a plugin model against the br a browser, then they can also build some really powerful other plugins too. But again, they're trying to get away from that. I mean, look what Shockwave and Flash, and now they're integrating HTML5 video and uh, media capture APIs and all this stuff within the browser. They're trying to get away from the need for plugins. And I think, and they're trying to make JavaScript more powerful and uh, even a faster language, better language, and more versatile language. So I think that that's where the key is going to lie going forward. It's not the plugin model. I remember having a conversation with one of my users in uh, Chicago, uh, and I was checking out her computer, and she was complaining that the 87 plugins she had loaded into Chrome were, were running really slowly. And I'm thinking, oh, you think? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what they're going to do. All right, let, let's talk about the big thing, because there was one announcement that I don't think anybody expected <laughs> at a Windows 10 preview, and that was holograms now uh, he, now it, it, it's funny because if you were if you're watching the event it kind of evolved because people were like holograms they, they just mean uh, like vr goggles right or ar goggles what, what this is not really a hologram what's going on here so so microsoft releases these glasses the 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 tech world collectively loses its stuff and now we're actually taking a look at it and people are even more impressed now that the hype is starting to die down can you tell me a little bit about what these glasses are and what they do yeah, I mean, basically, they're, they're what they call augmented reality glasses. And so what that means is, you know, fancy word for saying they're regular glasses that you can see through that you see with, with the whole device turned off, you see the world as you normally see it. But with the device turned on, it augments or it supplements your reality, meaning it, it can add things to it. And, and there's there's a whole slew of, of applications for this. That they, they show really cool video, what you're showing there. And there's other applications. A lot of the stories out there, like from different magazines like Wired and stuff, they have some really good descriptions of their experience. I think one of the coolest ones was they were like, you know, asked to go and actually hook up a new light switch in the wall. And so they had to walk up to the wall and then all of a sudden, an electrician popped on in front of them and he actually started drawing around the wires and telling them which wires to hook up and what to actually plug in. And, you know, you can, and there, there's an example of a plumber showing that woman how to do the plumbing job. Um, so that these are all different applications. Again, there's also the virtual reality, virtual environment mode where they can take you to a different world where the, your environment basically just disappears, which is more of the virtual reality type thing. But they can also, the biggest thing is really just augmenting or supplementing your current is you know putting video on the wall that's nearly not there, or, or you know uh, being able to supplement your learning by you know you know having somebody actually show you something visually rather than you actually having to listen to them talk and you know and write on a blackboard sort of thing. So that that's kind of the key is that's where the power of of augmented reality is is it it doesn't block out everything in your world and make you see through the eyes of the device. It lets you see through your eyes and let you see and add with the power of the device. You know, uh, I was excited for the Oculus Rift. Uh, and even though I can't wear it for more than 10 minutes because I'll start to throw up violently, <laughs> uh, it, it's cool technology. And actually, OpenVR, which I played with at CES, is also very cool because now you have a dev kit for under $200 that people can actually just start hacking away at. But the thing about VR was it was fun and it's entertaining, but I never saw a real world use a practical use for it beyond entertainment uh, in fact google glass seemed far bigger for me because of that idea that you could overlay something onto the real world google glass the problem was that a it was dorky it didn't look really good uh b it just never really lived up to the promise it never delivered on what they said it could i saw a product at ces the epson muverio which is ar it's built for AR, and it looks like a standard pair of glasses. It uses a little attached, looks like an Android device. Uh, it actually is an Android device. Um, right. And it was really good. It was really well made. I mean, that the camera could track physical objects. So, like, for example, you would look at a wall, and that wall might have a QR code. And so it would put a menu that surrounds the QR code. And as you moved your head, the menu would stay solid on, on that thing. It, th those, little, those little touches completely changed the AR experience. It, it really makes it convincing. But one of the, the drawbacks of having anything like the Muverio or, or Google Glass is if you don't have the glasses on right, uh, you, you get skewed images. And that's, that's just physics. So uh, again, one of the things that, that struck me about Microsoft's approach was this, this idea of projecting the images directly onto your eyes. 
it it removes that. There's no longer you're looking at it at a bad angle because you're looking at the same angle as the camera. Uh, and so I, I guess the only question I have is when can I get these? <laughs> so they, I mean, they pushed really hard to say that it's coming out in the spring, which, you know, that's where Windows 10 is supposed to come out too. So they're really pushing it hard. And again, it was a shock even for me. It's one of those things. I think there's an article on Wired that talks about the secret lab in Building 92. And anybody who's ever actually visited Microsoft knows that Building 92 is where the, sh the store is and where you can go in and, you know, tour just, a, you know, their, their, their hall of, of, of history and you know where the library is and if you go downstairs to the basement that's where all the training um uh, rooms were so to know that even below that was a, some secret laboratory that they were building an aug augmented reality glass is just kind of wacko crazy even for an engineer at microsoft so it's kind of a cool thing but yeah these things are crazy they have 18 sensors and um, they self-cool themselves with uh, passive cooling and, you know, 120 degree viewing and they track your eye movement. It's just some crazy technology built into these things. Yeah, it's, it's something that I, I absolutely want. I mean, I, I want it now. Uh, <laughs> and when you consider the fact that people were willing to shell out upwards of $1,700 for Google Glass once you included shipping and blah, blah, blah. If, if Microsoft, and I, I heard whispers of like a $500 price point, if Microsoft could pull that off, I mean, are you kidding me? Christmas send send me two, send me three. Actually, if you get an, an employee discount, could you buy? Could you buy like ten thousand pairs for the Twit TV army? And we'll just. <laughs> I wish they give you like a. I think it's a thousand dollar limit oh. at the Microsoft store, so you could barely even buy a Surface Pro, and then you're done. So, is that per Sorry. year or is that forever? Per year, per year. Well, that's no fun. Get that's that. no fun. Yeah. All right, let's 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 pull away from Microsoft a bit because I did promise our uh, our audience that we would talk about a couple of the other things happening in technology and we, we wanted to geek out about this one of the stories that has been making the rounds is drones quadcopters multi-rotors and actually one of the ones that was just released today was this idea that uh, there's a couple of drones that could be hacked there's malware maldrone that was custom developed by some security researchers that would hijack hijack personal drones now this specifically would target parrot bebop drones they say it could be used against other drones but not really. It could be used against any drone that's using Wi-Fi. So it has to have a TCP IP stack. And, it, and then it takes advantage of the reverse TCP IP stack request from the drone to be able to embed mal code on your, uh, on your, your, uh, your device. But um, the researchers were saying that they could use this to hijack a drone, to basically turn off the autopilot and take control of a craft, uh, you know, turning on the camera, turning on the microphone when you didn't know. This is, this is something I find interesting because I don't own any of these types of crafts. Most of my crafts are, are embedded devices. They don't have TCP IP stacks. But the idea that someone could hijack a toy and turn it into a, a surveillance device, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a little scary. Yeah, a little bit scary. <laughs> it's like the old days when they had the back office uh, one, port 139 thing on your PC where all of a sudden your, your CD your drive used to start opening and closing because somebody was controlling it through the, the open port. I mean, those, that's the kind of scary things that you, you don't want when it comes to things like uh, you know, flying devices and uh, with things with cameras on them. It's just not something you want. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Morbius in the chat room is asking uh, how many drones use Wi-Fi. There, uh, there's some very popular ones. I mean, Parrot. Parrot's all Wi-Fi. So their, uh, their uh, AR drone, the, both the 1.0 and the 2.0 version, uses Wi-Fi. Their new Bebop uses Wi-Fi. Uh, I've never been a fan of Wi-Fi-controlled multi-rotor uh, multi uh, craft. I, I like dedicated radios and transmitters. I like having smarts that I design. I like having uh, as little networking features in the craft as possible because, honestly, I don't need it. Uh, yeah, but, there's a yeah. lot of overhead when it comes to networking yeah. stacks. It, that, that's that's I mean I understand why they did it. They did it because they were still tr they were fighting against this perception that there's no reason to have a drone, and they were saying, look, you could use your phone, you could use your tablet, and that's that was their selling point. But nowadays, I don't think no no serious flyer I know would use a phone or a tablet to control a drone. Plus, yeah. you don't get the performance and the uh, the ability to kind of stream your your uh, directions over the Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi is good, but it's got its limitations. And plus, there's like, like I said, there's a ton of overhead with Wi-Fi, and and also the processors that use Wi-Fi they're not very power efficient yet. 
So, I mean, now you're looking, you know, you don't have dedicated hardware for the, you know, the RF control. You're using this specialized Wi-Fi controller. Your battery power is probably limited as well. Yeah. yeah. Distance too. Yeah. Well, the the funny thing about that is that um, uh, the the controllers that I use, so I use, I have a Father Sky controller, a uh, transmitter. I have one from uh, uh, Spectrum and I have one from uh, newer. It's a Fly Sky. They all use 2.4. So it's the, using the same spectrum as 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, but it's not a Wi-Fi signal. But because it doesn't have to use a Wi-Fi chipset, it actually uses about half the power right. of, a, of a craft that might be using Wi-Fi. So, yeah, take that for what it is. But let's, let's get past that because there's something that's much more fun. You heard about this, and actually my Twitter feed blew up about three seconds after it was, uh, it was reported because people wanted to know if I was in D.C., a drone did crash on the White House lawn. Uh, this happened on Monday. Uh, uh, now, the, a few fun things about this. Uh, the, the first part is uh, it was 3 o'clock in the morning when some uh, security officers start, saw a craft flying low before it crashed onto the White House lawn. Uh, they locked down the White House until it was determined that the craft posed no risk. And then the operator of the craft actually stepped forward, which that's... that's I'm, Kudos to him. That's for being very responsible. Uh, and then After he told he them. He slept it off, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> then he told them how unresponsible, irresponsible he was because he was drunk when he piloted it. And it wasn't his drone. It was his friends that he decided that he could just fly. Uh, now, there's a lot of things that we could talk about here, and we'll, we'll run through them a little bit. But first thoughts about um, uh, the White House being attacked by autonomous drones. <laughs> I think that one of the first things from my eyes was, you know, don't they have like radar? So shouldn't they be able to determine these small flying devices and what they are and where they're at at all point in time? They shouldn't be surprised that something's on the front lawn of the White House, if you think about it. That's the first thing that kind of came to my head was like, what the heck? Shouldn't that thing should have been shot down way before it even passed the fence? Yeah. So I think that's one of the first things. The second thing was... You know, they, they should have been able, it should be a, a kind of what they call a no-fly zone where they can basically block RF signal uh, when it, once it passes the fence. So, I mean, that that's where that drone should have just immediately just dropped out of the sky or at least found its way to the ground. So, I don't, I, I don't understand a lot of these things that came, kind of came up. But it's basically a, what the, you know, they basically tested, they're testing this. If you think about it, even though the guy didn't mean to do it, he basically showed a bunch of security holes and it's, it, it's, it publicly displayed the fact that there's some security holes with the White House and they better plug them right away. You know, uh, a few thoughts about that. One, uh, so I lived in, in D.C. for four years and actually my office was two blocks away from the White House. Every time a motorcade went down 16th Street, because our office was right on 16th Street, it would blot out any wireless. So if you were on a cell phone call, it would drop. If you were on Wi-Fi, it would de-auth and then re-auth. So obviously they were using signal jammers uh, uh, exactly. this, yeah, for to as they were having sensitive cargo go down 16th Street to make sure nothing was happening. But here, here's the problem, especially this. Whenever you hear about a crash, it's probably going to involve a DJI drone because it's nothing against the company. It's it's about a bunch of people who think that they could just buy a drone in a box, and because they buy a drone in the box, they think they can pilot it, and <laughs> they actually have no idea how it actually works. But a DJI, if it loses signal, it can do a couple of things. It can return home or it can try to automatically land itself. So even if they signal jammed it, it would still come down. <laughs> it's, that's, that's one of the things. Now, there, there are a couple of other mitigating circumstances surrounding the story. First, the guy was drunk. Okay, that, that's, let's be clear. All yeah. of D.C. is a no-fly area. You cannot fly drones in D.C. If you fly a drone in Washington, D.C., they will confiscate your craft. So obviously he was a little irresponsible. Uh, especially since, as the story seems to be coming out, he actually didn't know how to fly at all. Uh, it, it wasn't just that he was an inexperienced pilot. It was he was a new pilot. And he saw his friend flying it, so he thought, oh, I could do this, especially after I'm three sheets to the wind. Uh, but <laughs> it does bring up a very interesting question, which is some of these stories are funny. Some of these stories are anecdotal. A lot of these stories do make you kind of pause and say, ah, yeah, there's a couple of bad pilots who are, who are going to spoil it for everybody else. Yeah. But then there's part of me that says, last week we covered a story about an idiot flying a, uh, a DJI Phantom over an active airport in Turkey. Uh, there was a story about someone in Australia doing the same thing. Uh, last week there was also a story about a drone that crashed on the U.S.-Mexican border that was carrying meth into the country. At some point, there are going to be rules that come down. 
Can we can we agree on that? Yeah, I think I think I mean I know a really cool guy. His name is Jeff Prosais, and he's um, he's been flying RC jets for forever. He lives in Tennessee, and um, he is so worried that the drone community, since there's you know there's such a big fad now, that they're going to ruin it for him even because he wa- he loves to fly these amazing jets and not have to worry about any you know F- yeah, FAA regulations or anything like that. In fact, he makes his own jet fuel. I mean, those are the kind of things that are going to be completely down the toilet if if drones people start being stupid with drones. Right. But I mean, you can say that about anything. I, I remember for a while there, I was really big into biodiesel. I liked making my own biodiesel. Uh, I, I, in fact, I bought a generator that I could run biodiesel in just so I had a place to, to burn off the fuel. And it wasn't for anything. It wasn't really saving me any money. I just liked this idea of being able to turn <laughs> a waste product into something useful. But when you when I think about it, the process is actually dangerous. <laughs> I mean, in a populated area, it's not something you really want to be doing. Um, and there, there's a fine line between allowing people to explore stuff like that and clamping down on civil liberties. Uh, now, uh, there is a conversation going on in the chat room, and I think we need to address this. There will always be people, whenever we have a conversation about multi-rotor craft, who will bring out the smarmy stick and say, it's not a drone. Drones are big, black, and they kill people. A uh, 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 little personal rant here. Uh, drone basically just means a craft that doesn't have a pilot in it, a, a, that does not have a brain. In fact, you remember where the word drone came from. It, it comes from uh, the world of nature. Think of dro- uh, uh, worker bee drones, basically mindless automatons that do as, as they're told. What you're thinking of, the people with the smarmy stick, are UAVs and UCAVs. Uh, that's unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned combat aerial vo- vehicles. Those are the military craft. Drone is a generic term that can be applied to pretty much anything. Now, I prefer to call them multi-rotor, quadcopter, septicopter, octocopter crafts. But when someone says drone, I understand what they're talking about. And that end of rant. Uh, Lou, so as we move forward, are you going to become one of the drone faithful? Oh, yeah, I love drones. In fact, uh, I'm, I've been watching Know How trying to build my own. Oh, wait, Really? Yeah. When's the next time you're coming down to San Francisco? <laughs> Unplanned yet, but I do want to get down there soon. You know, one of the things that I've been wanting to do is I have, uh, I live at a high school in San Francisco in the sunset. And it has a huge football field that I have all to myself. And right next door is our two huge parks that are two, three times as big as the football field. And I would love just to get a bunch of pilots down there and do a fun fly, a park fly. Be awesome. You can have like a, a full day, kind of like they do with RC jets. They have like a full day of fly. Yeah. In fact, this weekend I was uh, I was flying. I I probably did about three hours of flying. I I used up uh, like twelve packs. I charged them up twice, <laughs> uh, and it was just a great day of flying. And, and right next door to me in the in the public park. So my field it belongs to the school. So it's just me. Next door there were people who uh, a bunch of kids who were setting up model rockets. And I'm like. I, that's how I started. I started with model rockets and now I'm flying quadcopters. This is great. It's like the circle of geek life. <laughs> there's a, up here in the mountains, there's uh, people, they, they, they actually jump off the side of the mountain up here. They, they go up to, they climb up to the top and then they jump, they parachute off. But they've been actually doing, you know, they've been building these huge, whether it's RC jets as well as these massive drones that they like, they, they lift things off the top of the mountain and bring it down to the, to the ground. It's pretty crazy seeing it like on a Saturday, you look up and you see these, you know, huge octocopters kind of flying over your head, like with, you know, three to four pound uh, payloads on them, kind of bringing and bringing stuff down from the mountain. So it's kind of crazy to see, you never think you actually see that in the sky before. Lou, I'm, I'm sorry, but we have actually reached the end of this episode of Padres Corner. It is so much fun just to geek out with you. Uh, you know, every once in a while, we'll we'll bring in a guest and we'll just chew the cud. Chew, chew, talk about nerdy stuff, and that's that's what I love having you on for. Now, you will be on the Twit TV network quite a bit. In fact, you're going to be on Coding 101 coming this Thursday. Uh, we're we're uh, starting a module with Steve Gibson. We're going to be doing a little bit of assembly, that, yeah. which is going to be um, my hero. Oh, I'm going to be writing myself. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm filming a bunch of episodes with Mark uh, Smitty. If you've ever been to DEF CON, we're doing a bunch of embedded processor stuff uh, using uh, the Atmel chipset, basically the Arduino. Um, and uh, you'll be part of that too. So could you please tell the folks where they can find you anytime they want to find out what Lou MM is up to? You bet. So it's Lou MM, Twitter. 
and that's L O U M M on Twitter. Uh, and of course, same thing on about me. Um, and also check out lewism.com. It's coming soon. It's not there yet. My Azure site's down for right now, uh, but uh, coming out soon uh, for some of my you know, personal projects that I've been working on. And of course, all my normal work, my day job at Microsoft, you can find me at crm.dynamics.com and all my work there. Lou Maresca, I thank you for being part of Padres Corner. We're going to have you back on in the very near future uh, just to have some geek out time. Until then, sir, I salute you. Take care. Thanks. Uh, folks, that's the end of this episode of Padres Corner, but, uh, you know, that's not the end of my involvement with Twit TV. If you are part of the Twit TV army, you probably know that I'm involved in a lot of shows here. I've got this week in Enterprise Tech on Mondays at 2.30. We talk about data center switches, basically anything that connects anything to anything. That's what we do on Mondays at 2.30. On Tuesdays, you can find me here, 7.30 p.m. for Padres Corner. It's light talk. Basically, it's a variety show for geeks. Now, on Thursday, you're going to find me twice, once at 11 o'clock a.m. for Know How. It's a DIY maker show. I get together with uh, Brian with Cranky Hippo, and we show you some of the projects that we've been working on, including a lot of quadcopter stuff. I'm sorry, that's just the way it turns out. We, we geek out, and that's the stuff we're geeking out to right now. And then at 1.30, you'll find me for Coding 101. If you want to get into programming or if you think you might want to think about getting into programming, that's a desire for a desire thing. It's, it's a Jesuit thing. Go ahead and join me at 1.30. All these shows are available at live.twit.tv. Now, in March, so coming up very soon, we're going to be flipping the schedule around a bit. This is just an early warning. On Mondays at the spot where I normally do This Week in Enterprise Tech, we'll be Coding 101. We're going to start making that show pre-recorded so you'll be able to watch that in all its glory every Monday at 2.30. Padre's Corner is actually going to be moving to Fridays. So on Thursday, you'll find me at Know How at 11 o'clock. And then on Friday, you'll find me three times for This Week in Enterprise Tech, for Before You Buy, which I'll be taking over, and for Padre's Corner. So Fridays are going to become sort of Fridays with Padre. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser thanking everyone who makes this show possible to Lisa, to Leo, to you, chat room. And remember, this is Padre's Corner, and you came out sane on the other side. Okay.